SF State's program in visual impairments presents Tech Talk, Episode 1, Chromebook Basics for Students with Visual Impairments. Presented by Jessica McDowell, TVI-ONM, Marin County Office of Education. Twitter at JustTVIONM. Video editing by Karen Tabayoyong, VI Program Student Assistant. Okay, guys, so we are recording now, and tonight is our first ever uh, tech talk for the San Francisco State VI program. Uh, we are welcoming Jessica McDowell, who is a TVI O&M extraordinaire in Marin County. And Jess, tonight you're gonna talk to us about basic Chromebook accessibility and getting it set up for our low vision students. So take it away, thank you. Thanks so much, Ting. Feel better. Okay, thanks, enjoy. Right. Okay, um, hello everybody. Thanks for joining tonight, and I want to be a resource and hopefully answer some questions. So I will go through um, some information and some things that I've discovered, and um, which have been, you know, some trial and error. And then um, I do have a quick video if we want to watch that together about setting up some Chromebook accessibility and um, we'll go from there. So um, I have two documents that I can um, figure out the best way to share with you. But um, what I made was some frequently asked questions for TVIs. So um, let me first talk about what a Chromebook is or and I, when I wrote this document, I wanted to start from the very scratch and in case you know, someone was not sure um, how, what the difference between a Chromebook and let's say a PC was. So, so basically um, a Chromebook gets you onto the internet and there's not a hard drive that really stores applications or files or information. And um, Chromebooks are Google, based so they get you onto the Google platform and in schools there's Google for education and so students are working within a um, umbrella of Google for education which the districts can set up with their um, the kids log in and that's where they where they're accessing docs and information and, and sharing with their classroom teachers so that all makes sense, right? And then, um, of course, PCs and other computers are storing things on the hard drive. So that's the big difference between Chromebooks and other um, computers and devices. So um, in the schools, they often use those little nine inch or maybe 11 inch Chromebooks, which have tiny screens and um, even with zooming in and some accessibility controls, they can be a nightmare for our kids, right? Um, so my, what we've done is often get a, hello, we've um, often, we go ahead and get a 15 inch Chromebook for students and those the cheapest one is about $250, so it's not a big expense for, for districts, um, and that solves the Okay, hey, made it in. Problem. Hello. There's a lot, <laughs> there's still a couple people in the old room that have the wrong number. Oh. Did, um, did they get, I just, I just gave them the, the new number to get to this room. So hopefully okay. they're coming. Okay. There's some more folks. And should we first go through and introduce, should everyone introduce themselves or you guys all in the same class and everyone knows each other? <laughs> we already know each other for the most part. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I agree with that. <laughs> All right, so should I continue or are those the few people that are still, okay. 
Um, so I've gotten 15 inch Chromebooks for students and it's usually a pretty easy thing to do in the district because the need is obvious. I think um, many people look at the small Chromebooks and, and feel like, oh, that's, that's definitely hard for a student with low vision. Um, a lot of what I'm talking about is the kids with low vision <clears throat> in the classrooms. Um, Braille and, is a whole different thing on a Chromebook. And um, most, most of my experience is working with those kids with um, um, low vision that are not legally blind, that are needing some large print and, and um, those kind of accommodations. So um, another question that teachers might have is, could an iPad just serve the, the need? Um, and one thing that I was thinking about with that is that the classrooms are teaching how to use the Chromebook. So um, all devices could get onto the Google platform. So um, yes, an iPad can go on and do most of the things that people would be doing on a Chromebook. Um, but if it would be, it's great if the student can be learning the technology that's used in the classroom and, and Chromebooks are becoming a curricular tool. So they have assignments and work that they're doing and they're all learning the, the hardware and um, together. So um, by giving a larger Chromebook, that is one way that the student then can just be learning with the class. And the teacher is able to support the student because they, they, the device is basically the same. The keyboard may have some different layout, but um, it's doing the same thing. So the teacher can just provide the regular teacher support and also the kids are learning from each other. So they'll be looking to each other for how to, um, how to proceed with the instructions. So if it's a young kid, if they can have a Chromebook, they're getting the instruction in the class. It, it doesn't have to be any kind of special pullout or anything. So that's, I think, ideal. And for an older student, I think that you're assessing the tools and the tasks that the student needs to do. And hardware becomes less of an issue because the students are more independent with their devices and they just need to you know, do the work that they could use a different device and they know how to problem solve that. So does that make sense? That mm -hmm. would be great to, um, you know, our students do need literacy on different devices. So, um, so maybe I'll tell you a story of how I, um, I learned something from a student one time. I had a, I think she was about third grade and the classroom was using Chromebooks <clears throat> and she, um, I was thinking that, you know, she would need the power of a PC because she could use um, Zoom text and some other uh, software and it just seemed like in the future or in the next you know few years or middle school she's going to need a PC so I actually thought well let's just go for the PC because she can do that now I had to ask the district to buy something and that's not always an easy thing so I recommended a PC and of course on a PC you can just open up Chrome and do all the things that you would do on a Chromebook um, and she she was not happy with that <laughs> and so in class it ended up even though it feels like it wouldn't be a big deal in class it was a pain for her because things weren't exactly the same the teacher wasn't able to kind of jump in and give the same kind of quick prompts. The teacher has a whole class, so she doesn't, she's not really able to stop everything and, and problem solve. And um, it was different. And so this student happened to have a, her dad had a large Chromebook at home, which she used all the time and she loved. And she basically just put her foot down and said like, no. <laughs> so we got her a big Chromebook and she's actually in middle school and still uses it all the time. It's been a device that's, that's really served her and she's super comfortable with. And she can go on a computer too and use that. But um, that was just a case where it's like, all right, that she made, that was a good point that she, um, you know, that I learned from her. So 
Also, the cost of a Chromebook is something that in early elementary you can have for a few years and then that can be transferred to another kid if it's still functioning, you know, and move on to other devices. So, um, so testing on a Chromebook, of course, I think folks are familiar with that that is a common device in schools that they do testing on. So the, the big screen for testing is super important um, for, for most kids. So um, that is also a good point for the districts in terms of them being willing to get a large Chromebook. Um, so the, the Braille student, I think that the technology for a Braille student would be, that's a much bigger assessment and planning. So although that um, there's Braille devices that connect um, compatible with the, the Chromebook and Chromevox keeps getting better and better. Um, right now the testing, the state testing, as of last year required um, a PC and required a Braille display and required JAWS um, and a Windows environment on a PC. So um, it, might, it might change and testing could happen on a Chromebook and there may be a point where Braille is compatible. So I would say just stay in contact with the kind of community VI tech and see what's happening with that. Um, but I don't think that that's compatible with testing um, anytime soon, so. Um, I have a quick question. Yes. Um, so sorry, you were saying that you pretty much think that a larger Chromebook would suffice, but for a screen reader, if someone needs a screen reader, are you also recommending that a Chromebook should be okay if that's what the class is using, or at that point they need a laptop? I would think, yeah, I think my, I think my point is that for a student that needs screen reading, um, that the the tech assessment would be much more involved and probably the ter termination that they're if they need to be learning jaws or nbda that's probably the important um you know direction to go with them and their experience using a computer in the classroom will will be different than the other kids okay right does that make sense yeah yeah um so do you want me, I have like a five minute video. So maybe now some of the accessibility pieces of getting into a Chromebook, which um, I'm not sure if that's new or you're familiar with. I do have a video that's um, short that I could show and may illustrate some of this and um, then it, we could go for some questions after that and I have some other things to mention. Video? Thumbs up? Okay, now I just have to figure out to make, see if I can get there. So share my screen. No, basic. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, so is that sharing my screen right now? Okay. Oh, this might not have been a good idea. Hold on. Oh, okay. Is this, does that work? Do people see my screen? Yes. I have a beach scene. Okay, that's a Chromebook screen. Okay, we're there. So I'm gonna hit play and um, Miss Steam, if there's a big problem, maybe you can text me <laughs> because I, all right. Hi, this is Jessica. I want to show you how to get a large mouse cursor on your Chromebook and also a couple of ways to zoom. So right now I'm at the default settings. So I have a tiny little mouse pointer here and small icons. So I'm going to open up Chrome and I have a web page here about dachshunds and the text is very small. So the two ways that we can zoom is a web page zoom which is just the standard control plus, minus, and zero. So that looks like control plus. The web page text and pictures are getting larger. So can, and then if I want to go back.
back to the 100%, that's control zero. It jumps back to the 100%. Now, on this option, the tabs are still quite small and the icons at the bottom are small. So the accessibility screen resolution command to change that is control shift plus minus zero. So that looks like control. Um, there's no audio. This is Kayla, and it's also kind of choppy. Just to let you know. Uh, this is Patrick. I have a quick question. So there's the web page Zoom. Is that what we're supposed to be looking at right now, or is this the other version of the Zoom? Um, I think the last thing was the the full screen resolution Zoom, and I can review those two. Did, did someone, is someone not getting the audio? I'm not getting the audio. I don't have audio either. Oh, well that's, that's, hmm. Did, did anybody get the audio? For a short while and then you cut out, then it was cut out. Okay. I'm not able to see the audio, I but I can see the writing on the bottom. I can, yes. Jess, I think it was just the last 15 seconds that were slow um, in the video. Are you muted, Jessica? This is Kayla. Yes, thank you. <laughs> um, so I'll just, I'll finish it and then if someone, um, wasn't getting the audio and wasn't getting the, the captions, um, then we can review that and then I can send the link also, um, but it's just a little bit left. Sound okay? Yes, thank you. I think that we can't hear the audio because you're muted. Open up settings. I can also... Okay. Jess, you need to unmute. Thank you. Um, okay, so I'll leave it unmuted and see if that, that probably works. Which is Alt Shift S. Alt Shift S gets you to settings. Um, still need to open up at your icon, check was there, Alt Shift S, yeah. So now I'm in settings and I would need to go down to accessibility, which is in advanced. So at the bottom of the settings page is advanced. I'm open that and continue down and accessibility, looking for manage accessibility features. When I open that, I'll have several categories, text-to-speech, display, keyboard, and touch, mouse and touchpad. So if I show large mouse cursor, yay, I now have a large pointer and cursor. I have some options for the size as it goes. Um, so it's nice to highlight the mouse cursor when it's moving. And students that like that. So now I have a red circle around that arrow and I, I found the red circle stays there all the time. So it's not just when it's moving, but that has a problem. So that's how you get the large mouse cursor. All right. So two ways to zoom and getting the large cursor are a couple of important things to help with the visual settings on a Chromebook. 
this Hi, this is Jessica. I want to show you how oh. to get a large yeah. mouse cursor on your Chromebook and Sorry also a couple of ways to zoom. So right now I'm at... Okay, I'm back. <laughs> um, so I'll provide the, the links and stuff in if you want to review that. Was there any questions? Sorry, it was a little choppy there in terms of the audio. Um, I have a quick question. I mean, kind of back to the beginning. Uh, this is Patrick. Um, so you had the you had the web page zoom, and then you had the full screen resolution. Those are two different ones. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Yeah. yeah the, it, I could find it. You don't have to go through it. I that would be fine. Yeah, it's just um, the con command plus works in the web page, and then the Command Shift, um, actually on the on the it's Control for the Chromebook. It's different on the Mac, but the Control Plus is just the web page, and Control Shift is the full re changes the screen resolution. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Um, so there's also um, I had shared a keyboard command that got you to settings or pretty close to settings. Um, and on the Chrome um, website in the help section, they have a list of keyboard commands. So it's great when you're working with students to start using those. And I have a document that has some of my favorites. And um, I also, there's some uh, links to those, like a short URL. If you're familiar with a um, bit.ly, like putting bit.ly in to your browser, you can just type that in with Chromebook accessibility. So you can remember that you could always get to, um, get to the information about getting to these accessibility settings or getting to shortcuts. And I'll provide the, you'll have a document with that so you can see that. Um, so when I'm working with a student, we can start using keyboard commands to get to different tabs and other, um, you know, get around the Chromebook starting to introduce those. Um, the other thing that I thought I would mention is, um, I know a lot of people in districts and counties are, are trying to figure out how to get technology for their kids. And so I'll just quickly run through a process that works um, where I am, and I know everybody has many different um, places are very different in how they work, how you would get technology. Um, but as a county employee, I work with different districts, and the process would usually go um, start out with either there's an assessment coming, like a triennial assessment or an initial assessment, or there's a, a problem that we found, like you walk in and and you didn't know, but like this happened to me this year. It's like there's the nine inch Chromebook in front of my kid and the principal is like, hey, he can't see that. And it's like, oh, okay, that's a problem. I didn't, you know, I didn't know that was coming. Um, so I would talk to the administrator or email the administrator and just say, oh, we have this problem or we want to look at this technology that would serve this purpose. And, um, you know, usually they're agreeable to that. And then, and I get the IEP team. The administrators want to know what the IEP team recommends, not just what maybe an outside consultant is telling them to buy. So involving the IEP team and, and kind of you, it's a lot of education sometimes, like why, why you need to look at a different device for your student. And then um, you can do a quick, a quick trial for something like a Chromebook and you just need to show like, oh, we need a big Chromebook. That's that can be pretty quick. Like you really just if you have access to a big Chromebook and you observe the kid on the Chromebook, um, you would say what tasks do we want that student to do? What's our criteria for success? And usually they're going to like be really happy on the big one and, and it works smoothly. And then you can you know, with that observation, just write that up quickly. We wanted to see if the student could 
<clears throat> um, you know, go to the math website and do some activities in his class. And um, he did that and, and the IEP team has some ideas for goals that will increase his accessibility to his curriculum, which are always, you know, important words that you're using when you're um, talking to districts about technology. And um, with that, then you can amend the IEP to add that in if it's not there already. And um, that usually works pretty smoothly. Um, sometimes it's just clear cut and, and in my case the other day where he had a little Chromebook, I was just able to say like, woo, let's get him a big one. And everybody was like, yes, do it now. But we still wanna get that into the IEP in case, so that's just clearly documented, so. Um, Anybody have any questions or anything about that? Hi, this is Kinette. I have a question. Um, I wanted to know if you can ever buy devices with quota funds. Um, that's my question. Um, with quota funds, that would just be what APH has, and they don't have these kind of mainstream devices. They would have the unique they would have the unique things, you know, like the Mac Connect or the um, Braille displays that they, they have now, or the, like the Visio book or something. Um, as far as low incidence, that's another issue. And where I am, I think districts do get reimbursed for low incidence. Um, and since and I can mention that, you know, that I can send in the, I can give them low incidence paperwork and the IEP pages to make it easy for the secretary. But the caution there and the important thing is that the district is responsible for that um, low or high tech or technology, um, assistive technology for the student to access the curriculum, regardless of how they fund it. So in the, over the years, I've talked to people that say, oh, we couldn't get that because it wasn't, we couldn't get it on low incidence. And that's not actually a fair thing for a district to, to pull. It's, um, if it's, has gone through the IEP process and it's, there's been an assessment and there's been an IEP team recommendation and it gets into the IEP, that's in the IEP and the district needs to provide it. But um, where we are, there has been some flexibility and they can, they can, I, I write up the paperwork that says, you know, this is functioning as an assistive technology, you know, for a student with low vision or a visual impairment, and they've been able to um, sometimes get re low incidence reimbursement for something like a large screen Chromebook or iPad. Any other thoughts, questions there? All right, so let me see. So if there, does anybody have any um, stories or concerns in, um, from their experience or in thinking about these things that we could talk about and see about problem solving or other experiences or workarounds for those small Chromebooks? This is Sarah, and I have a question because I'm always torn when we talk about even the enlarged sized Chromebooks for low vision kiddos. Um, I get that it's very clear that it's, you know, uh, Braille display, JAWS, automatically goes PC, but then when you've got your low vision kiddos, if we aren't teaching them Windows key commands that allow them to use quick shortcuts long term, like for high school, college, job. Where are they learning those? Yeah, I think that's that's a good question. And as I was um, putting together the the like looking at the list of shortcuts on the Chromebook, I um, I wondered how many. Are, are the same, you know. I was, wondering the, I was wondering the same thing because if they aren't transferable where those key commands really only work on the Chromebook, 
none of our students are going to go on to job, you know, post high school, college, and be functioning on a Chromebook. And so if we aren't teaching them, you know, old school CSD windows without a mouse and building those shortcuts, we're teaching our kids to constantly go into enlarging the mouse and still hunting in the menu bar and Google Docs has less built in functions for them in terms of formatting and tools to help our low vision kiddos. So I, I always am torn with, yes, the question is, is it a Chromebook or nothing for our kiddos because of the price point or, or do we push for the device that will grow with them and give them long-term school skills that they'll need to access a job? Yeah. Okay. That's a really good, good things to be considering. And that's, I think my story with my younger student is that was, you know, kind of what I was thinking, huh? I was like, okay, here, you know, PC long-term, let's teach her the skills she needs. We're going to work on that now. Um, but because she was young and because the classroom was all learning a device and she, she was just a kid, I didn't need to necessarily pull her out to teach her this stuff because she's a whiz and she just, you know, is picking it up. So whatever they were doing in the classroom, if she had a similar device that just wasn't so visually fatiguing, um, it, that totally worked for her. Um, she happens to be in a middle school now that is a Chromebook. They, they use Chromebooks. So um, I don't feel that I'm, that she's not getting skills because she would, she can also be on a PC. Um, and so I think that's an assessment that's important for a student because um, I've had students cycle through using a Chromebook in middle school, maybe they're using the iPad. And I find in high school, it's like, okay, here's your MacBook. And they just, they're off and running. It's not that, um, but some students may need the longer term focus on, on one system to really establish those skills. So I think that's part of the assessment. Um, and I think that there's a lot of kids that are just, you know, sharp and they're, they're moving on and, you know, in the same way that we, you know, if I'm on a, I'm usually on a Mac and I know those commands and I found, you know, I do the wrong one accidentally on a PC and I'm like, oh, I gotta, you know, adjust and then get it back. My muscle memory goes back to how you would do that on PC. And I think a lot of our kids are, you know, moving that fast too, but there's some that would benefit. Like you said, I think that you're, especially kids with that really need more accommodations um, in terms of screen reading, like um, someone brought up before. So all part of the assessment, but very good questions. Thank you. Thanks for talking through it with me. I have to get clear on my mute and unmute. <laughs> um, so I'm thinking, um, I've done a little with Chromevox and um, it's kind of cool. I think it, I think it can be um, something that you can introduce kids to um, if you are working, if you've gotten, they're working on a Chromebook and you are having some time to teach them you know, either keyboarding and, um, and the keyboard commands. Um, you can explore the speech to text with them. Also, the other thing is um, accessing Bookshare books. And Bookshare has some great tutorials on using um, Read Now, which would be the, one of the first ways you would try to read Bookshare books on the Chromebook. Um, are folks familiar with a with read now within bookshare is that something you've seen mm -hmm. um, when you go it does um, is bookshare familiar to everyone yeah so you're going um, kids are signed up and you're getting um, going to the website and you can get books 
um, digital books for them in many different formats. So they're Daisy with pictures or without pictures, or we can get Word docs now. We can also get EPUB documents, which can be opened in iBooks on the iPad. Um, when a student is logged in with their student account, um, there's an option after they um, select a book that is read now that's a button that will appear um, by the book that they have um, downloaded and when or when or the book that they've selected it probably doesn't download because it just opens in a browser when they select read now that book opens basically in a browser window and there's controls um, to move through the pages and there's also speech to text it's it's um it's a little clunky as far as you might need to use the mouse, but there are key key commands um, that have that will work. Um, so some on the Chromebook, I I say that it was a little clunky. Last time I tried that, the key commands for the for reading out loud weren't working smoothly, but that could have been my older Chromebook. So um, it's something to um, explore. I don't know that it has the features of some of the note-taking um, options that an older student might need, um, but a, a great thing to explore. And I have a student right now that I'm working on her opening up some of her Bookshare books on the Chromebook because that um, they are using that in class um, for reading and stuff. So I'm trying to figure out the best workflow for her on that. Any questions there? Kayla, sorry, I feel like this is a silly question. Um, I've used Bookshare for my students in the sense of I have put books on their list and they already know how to use it, um, but I'm still kind of new to it as far as myself using it and being able to teach my students how to use it um but can you do a quick um i guess like gloss over as to the differences and why i would choose daisy versus epub versus electronic um, <laughs> yeah um yes there's so many options it is there's a lot um i also i saw that bookshare just posted a um they have a um, a tool, they called it a wizard, um, as far as looking at the ways to read. So what, what device is, is one of your students using? iPad, typically. Um, I'm trying to get a computer for one of mine, though, because he has just a tiny Chromebook, but I think he, he needs a screen reader, though, so I'm going to do PC for him. Okay, yeah. With the iPad, um, I, I think that Voice Dream Reader is a nice interface for students reading on the iPad. I also, depending upon if the student is um, like a younger student that has low vision and really is using pictures and um, pictures are beneficial to learning to read, um, then the EPUB option is really nice because that can just be opened up in iBooks. So when you go on to, when the student um, on the iPad was to go to Bookshare on the browser and choose a book or go to their reading list, if you put a book on their reading list, then you could choose EPUB as the format and then you would get a screen that would say um, open in and you could choose iBooks and um, iBooks is nice because it's just that page flip. It's very intuitive that, that students are, are familiar with. Um, also the adults and the teacher, that's something they're familiar with. It's, they don't, you know, it's easy for them to jump in and support the student. And so that can be a factor in assessment too. Um, oh, I think Honey just walked by. <laughs> um, so that is a, a consideration. I like the EPUB in eBooks, um, but Voice Dream Reader is great for the, the audio. 
Um, I don't think that it's showing pictures right now. So there's there's always a lot of factors that you're figuring figuring out. Did that answer one of your questions? Uh, yeah, kind of. I was just unsure on the daisy and electronic too, like why those would be beneficial over another. Yeah, the daisy. Um, I um, the daisy players and the daisy um, that format would be good for. I I don't use it a lot, so I don't know if um, anyone has other experience, but. Um, there's daisy players. I think if you're getting those books on a um, Victor reader or other device, that that's um, the format. And daisy is a standard accessible um, format too. And those can be opened up um, in a web in a web page, I believe. So I would check out the um, Bookshare their new wizard as far as reading devices and check out their they have um, nice quick little tutorials like just a minute or two on how to do you know a very specific task so um, I I think that there is so many options so it's just a you know each student looking at the task and what's going to work from that for them and then you just continue to build from there um, okay And is there um, other other thoughts about Chromebooks or technology in the classroom? I've heard that some teachers have set up like another monitor um, or keyboard. I have a question. Uh, this is Patrick. I uh, in class the other day, Ting had a accommodation that was uh, sh share. I don't know, I forget the catch word right now, but it was something like uh, shared the same screen as the teacher. Anyhow, I was just wondering if that was common because that caught my ear and I just thought it was genius. Yeah, that's great. If there's um, sometimes in a classroom, if the teacher is presenting things from her com his or her computer, and the student has like an iPad and they can join, they can be connected. So what the teacher is projecting through a projector up onto the board can just be beamed, so to speak, to the student's iPad. That's, that's awesome. Um, that can be, um, it's getting, I think it's getting easier. That can often be a little tech problem um, to solve. I've had um, the district, tech person come out and help set up what's called like a VCN viewer or VNC viewer to do that. Um, there, I think it's just a case by case figuring out what, um, what is being used and how. Um, Join Me is an app that allows that. I think that there's some other apps too. So um, it's, it's a great way to get uh, what's projected up there onto the student's iPad. <clears throat> yeah, it seemed great and super basic and I never would have thought of it, you know, so I don't know, that was just eye opening, really. Yeah, yeah, <clears throat> there's um, so many ways to, to, to solve some of these problems. So um, it, um, I had a thought about um, keyboarding. Um, now that I have a, a young student that did just get a Chromebook and we're working on keyboarding, um, I have found that the classrooms, when they do keyboarding together, they, um, they're they often on programs that are basically games that are racing and our kids, mm -hmm. and they all want to win, of course, <laughs> and, and our kids look at the keyboard and they're just down there trying to get as fast as they can. And, um, and then I come in and I'm like, okay, don't look at the keys. And they're like, oh, I hate this. <laughs> um, so it's so tricky. So um, I, I'm just really trying to get the time and have I just some trying to get some fun ways to help my student keyboard without looking at the keys to start building um, the, the touch typing skills. 
and um, it's really tricky. I I find if it's a game um, that the it's measured by act by speed, and then they just they want to win, of course. So um, sometimes I'm just making up silly sentences for them to copy, or or working on on common words instead of drilling like F J F or something, but just start. So they start getting words under their fingers that that flow. Because I think when we type, we we kind of we do, you know, when we type the, we have a little rhythm to typing the. Um, so that was that's just something I've been mulling over about typing. So I don't know if you guys have um, have ideas about that, Jessica. I know that. Uh, the cloud when the students are learning in the classroom with the whole class students don't have a chance really to to learn to touch type they're just kind of going along and they're getting a score and and it's not remediated within a large classroom so it it is something that I would encourage to you know find that IEP time to do and to do exactly what you're what you're suggesting is finding games, building up the rhythm in the fingers, um, and I use all kinds of screens and faces above the and for short periods of time with lots of um, you know inner building up inner challenge and and you can see when the students begin to get that motor memory in their fingers. Um, there are some programs, but but they're. They're not always compatible with the Chrome. <laughs> um, so I, my, my last student, I was just making it up in a certain way and that was giving it great success. So we could talk some more about that and we could talk about it in 601 as well. Oops, excellent. I, I, I think that that's something that um, is important. Yeah, it's important. And when I have a middle school kid that it's so hard to backtrack and say, don't look at the keys and they get so frustrated. Um, so it- Can I ask a stupid question? Oh, of course there's no. <laughs> so way back in the beginning when you were talking about how the Chromebook did, doesn't have a hard drive, so it doesn't okay. store, but we put apps on Chromebooks, don't we? They, they kind of run, I, I feel like I need it. Am I not muted? I feel like I need a, a technology person to really explain this, but I think if I understand correctly, they basically run through the browser. You're put there. It's more like an, yes. more like an extension or an add on. Mm -hmm. they, they're kind of called, I think they might be called apps now, but they're basically like a, a little uh, useful tool that only happens within that browser. It's not, you could go on to another computer and if you have that extension and you log in as you, it's gonna pop up there as, as an extension that you can use that's connected to your cloud experience. Okay, and so if a student was using an iPad and they had a bunch of apps and stuff they liked on the iPad, are they gonna be able to get the same sort of stuff on the Chromebook if there's not really apps happening? No, and that's a whole different company and a whole different environment. So um, those are very, those are iPad, iOS, you know, the mobile Apple operating system specific. Um, so when you go on a PC or a Chromebook, if you wanna do the same thing, then you'd have to find the analogous um, add-on or extension, or if you were on a PC, you know, you could load a program that did that. So I guess comparable, like on an iPad, you would have voiceover, and then when you move to a Chromebook, it's called ChromeVox, and it's their operating system, text-to-speech, and then on a PC, you could add on, Windows has narrator, or you could add on software like JAWS or NVDA. Kind of different environments. Thank you. Sometimes, yeah. sometimes they cross over. There is a one. There is one typing program that the districts use, 
and I can go onto the cloud and download it onto the iPad, but it serves as an extension on the Chrome. So you do have to play around sometimes, but it's, they are different. Yeah, yeah. And some, some programs, companies create, you know, versions for all the platforms. Yeah. yeah. So. Huh. And I, I appreciate everyone um, coming and hanging out tonight. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you, Jessica. Thanks. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Good night. Thanks, Jess. Okay. Thank you, Jess. Thanks. Take care. Thanks, Thanks. Jess. Yeah. Nice to see you again. <laughs> yep. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Faith. Nice to see you. Thanks so much. Okay. Good night. Good night.